speakers. But now coming to who is joining us as speakers for this session, for this hybrid event. So let me just quickly uh, introduce who our speakers are. Uh, joining us from Geneva, uh, we have Mrs. Nur Surina Abdullah, who is the chief at the Digital Knowledge Hub Department at the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, good afternoon, Surina. Furthermore, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Jovan Kurbalia, who is joining me here uh, in Geneva. And Jovan is the head of the Geneva Internet Platform, the partner of this series and the director of Diplo. Welcome, Jovan. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, furthermore, we have Mr. Jonas Bausch, who is joining us from uh, Abidjan, and uh, he is the Youth Employment Officer at the International Labour Organization. Yeah, sorry, uh, good afternoon. A digital, yeah. <laughs> Don't you... Apologies for this uh, technical glitch. Uh, good good afternoon, everyone. also. Yes, good afternoon to you, Jonas. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Mrs. Nanjira Sambuli, uh, joining us from Nairobi. Uh, she's a fellow in, at the Technology and International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International uh, Peace. Welcome also to you, Nanjira. Perfect. And uh, if you allow me, I will actually kick off with you. Uh, you uh, live uh, in Africa, uh, you're a big advocate uh, of change uh, coming to the African region, and we can probably see Africa as a kind of laboratory uh, of the aspects of tech for development. Now, uh, could you uh, share with us uh, some of your observations and experience on issues such as uh, you know, limitations of uh, limits on the access to the internet uh, and the kind of spillover effects it might have on issues such as economic growth? Over to you, Nanjira. Are we good? Now I've been unmuted. I've been given permission to speak. Here we are. Good day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for having me in this discussion. Um, I want to start by responding to that question by saying, I think all too often um, when tech is being discussed in the auspice of development, there's a lot we don't talk about, which is around the narratives and the ideas around who should be doing this development. And I want to start there. Um, often when we hear technology being brought into development settings, like in Africa, when we talk about the digital divide, which is very real, you hear narratives like we need to leapfrog. So you end up with ideas, for example, um, in Ethiopia, where we all, if you follow the news, you know what is ongoing, but somebody thinks the biggest solution there is blockchain ID. Or um, some people who think, you know what, let's use drones for vaccine delivery. So this concept of leapfrogging to these new fantastical technologies that are not contextual to where we are with the development trajectory is introducing a dangerous new approach that could create new divides we cannot possibly close. So we need to be very careful when we imagine what technologies can and cannot do um, in, in addressing some of the big or grand wicked challenges we have in a place like a continent. Then there's a notion of this uh, laboratory uh, idea that we do need to uh, put paid. Um, we see that it's gone from just being something that was done by the development sector. We are seeing that the tech community in Silicon Valley and other capitals are starting to think of it in the same way. And all too often, this idea of experimentation or pilot programs or you, know, you name it, however we frame it, is often a cover for the fact that um, whatever is going to be brought in as a system or as a tool is going to allow the person who's bringing it to get more benefits from the African. So there's a very extractive relationship there that has seeded by default that needs to be stopped and it needs to be called out. Lastly, I'll leave it at the fact that whatever barriers we say we want to address um, on the continent as far as development and the use of technology goes, must also address the social, the political, the cultural and economic realities. We cannot talk about universal access to the internet, for example, without having universal access to reliable energy. So however much you want to use the latest technology to connect the unconnected, the reality is they will still need a way to be connected to charge their devices and all of this. So this, there's systemic ways we need to bring into this understanding. We need to look at cultural areas and barriers will uh, dynamics like languages and so many others. And all these have to happen at once. So in some is to say that whenever you say you want to roll out a project in Africa or elsewhere in the developing world for tech for development, also remember that the person who's the ultimate uh, expert here is the African that you say you're working for. So if they're not involved in the design, in the, in the thinking, in the deployment, there's not going to be a trust and sustainability uh, that will, will, be, will come out of your process. 
Thanks, Teresa. No, thank you, Nanjira. And uh, it's excellent that you started the session with, uh, with a very healthy uh, reality check. Yeah, in terms of uh, what uh, the reality sometimes is and uh, how little sensitivity there sometimes is to, to the nuances uh, that you have mentioned. So thank you for that. Uh, Jovan, if I may turn to you. Uh, one, uh, of course, uh, big issue uh, in uh, talking about tech for development is also the underlying issue of capacity development. So could you, uh, could you maybe uh, try to... Uh, Explain to us how you see the role of capacity building, capacity development in the context of tech for development. What needs to be done to have impact? Sure. Uh, by building on what Nanjira just indicated, is uh, uh, it's crucial to ground it into the local dynamics and, the, and reality. Uh, we had different phases in te technical assistance and development in the last, let's, let's say, 40, 50 years, especially after after the decolonization process. And uh, most, uh, there were many breakthroughs, but there were also many failures. Mm -hmm. And the failures are particularly related on uh, when, uh, when the donors were imposing solutions. Therefore, let me just highlight with the green or <laughs> yellow highlighter, what Nanjira said, anchor it into the local dynamics. Mm -hmm. In particular, digital technology is uh, more embedded into social and cultural context. Therefore, it, it matters more than, let's say, bringing the, the agricultural machines or uh, uh, big uh, power plants or something like this. With te digital technology, we are impacting local social and cultural context. In this context, and I'm happy that you uh, choose the word development, capacity development, not, not capacity building. Capacity building has this external connotation. You come and build something. It should be comprehensive uh, development. And what uh, uh, we have to do is to anchor it into the local context, A, B, to, uh, to have it uh, uh, more comprehensive, moving beyond definitely just building individual capacities. We have quite a few training activities, let's say on digital governance, not enough, but cybersecurity, different organizations are doing, but there is very little on institutional capacity development. If you train people and people may stay in their ministry or move or sometimes move to, to the developed world. And this is the serious problem. Therefore, individual capacity development plus institutional capacity development, and I would say systemic, creating the rules and the context in which we can realize all potentials of digital technology when it comes to economy, culture, uh, personal empowerment, and overall uh, um, um, sort of uh, empowerment of society. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jovan. Just a super quick sub question. Do you think there is a, like a positive trend? Are we making progress in this regard? Uh, not exactly, okay. not exactly. I think that there was, pushed towards uh, holistic capacity development, let's say 10 years ago, but uh, it is now moving to individual training again, moving back. Therefore, we have to remove dust from some of the papers that were written, let's say 10 years ago, and we may share with uh, by OECD, DAC committee, EU was very proactive, Swiss development cooperation on this comprehensive capacity development. And we have to, to, to be very clear, I think that we, made uh, some sort of devolution not uh, it was it was we made quite a few steps back with the simplifying capacity development as just individual training hmm. well thank you very much for that and i hope that you know our session will allow to maybe dig into some okay, possible sure. solutions on uh, how to how to improve the situation a little bit uh, more uh, i would like to turn to uh, to you Sulina now uh, now Something that also resonated very much at the Internet Governance Forum last week, uh, for instance, was that yes, tech for development is important, uh, but very often uh, this kind of um, starts and finishes uh, at the issue of um, insufficient uh, digital skills. Now, how do we tackle this issue of providing the right basic digital skills uh, for people to reap the benefits of digitalization? Sulina. Thank you, Teresa. Um, that actually resonates very well with what um, Jovan was just saying. And the ITU, you know, at the ITU can really 
see what you're trying to say when you talk about institutional capacity. Now, we also believe very much that you know, capacity development has to start with the institution. So the approach that we take is access, adoption, and value creation. But in the access part, it's not just about access to services or connectivity. It's also creating that entire ecosystem. And part of it is institutionalizing capacity. Um, but that, that's just a side comment. But back to your question, you were saying that um, skills, Teresa, it goes right to the heart of the matter, actually. It's not just skills, but the correct skills. Yeah? But um, let's take it from a digital skills perspective, because like it or not, 2.9 billion people or 37% of the world's population have never, ever connected to the internet. And 96% of those who are offline are actually in developing countries. So, I mean, it's no surprise that, you know, a lack of digital skills is one of the main barriers to internet usage in developing countries. But from a global perspective, there's a narrowing digital skills gap, if you'd like, in, in the labor market. And it also means that um, there are huge job opportunities for those with the right digital skills. Basic skills is one and those at intermediate. But right now, if you want to talk about digital skills across the board, I think there is a lot of effort being put um, at the ground level. And this is something that I like to say that, you know, there's never enough of digital skills training, if you'd like. Jovan, I know what you mean about, you know, uh, maybe you're going back to training the individual, but the fact of the matter is you do have to train the individuals while you institutionalize capacity. Now, the pandemic, though, has accelerated this trend because it's due to an increase in the digitalization and the demand for a digitally skilled population in the workforce. So developing digital skills is critical. Um, we all know this both for job success as well as participating in a digital society. And tens of millions of future jobs in the online economy will need far more advanced digital skills. And we're talking about coding, software, app development, big data analysis, IoT, cybersecurity, you name it. But you know, as advanced digital skills become more important for employment and also for the success of entrepreneurs, there will soon be a talent gap for workers, especially with advanced ICT com competencies. And this need for qualified workers is really made worse or by various socioeconomic inequities, such as the lack of internet access at home or the lack of training opportunities or maybe the lack of financial resources. But at the end of the day, the digital divide is also a skills divide. And young people today, Teresa, have been called digital natives, but the majority of young people may not in fact possess sufficient job relevant digital skills to fill vacancies. Um, what we found in our latest facts and figures of 2021, the ITU's measuring the digital divide report, is that less than 40% of individuals in 40% of the countries that we surveyed reported having carried out an activity which requires basic digital skills in the last three months. And that just tells you also that out of the 4.9 billion people who are connected to the internet, that connection or that usage is very, very intermittent due to what Nanjira was saying. Sometimes it's affordability, sometimes they don't have that connectivity. And really the pandemic has boosted that digitalization and reveal all the challenges that still exist when it comes to connecting households, connecting people, and giving them those skills that they need to participate meaningfully online. So we need to work together. We need to really band together, pull resources, um, and, and find that, that um, I don't know, there's no silver bullet, but if we don't work together to get this done together, it's not going to work out. And more and more people are going to be needing digital skills. I mean, there's no turning back. It's like when you first got your phone, your first mobile phone, you're never ever going to turn back to a time where you're not going to have a phone. So digital skills are here to stay. And so we've got to find a way to do it. And we feel the way to do that is really through strategic partnership. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Solina. Uh, that was uh, insightful. And we also uh, acknowledge the, the great role that the ITU uh, is playing uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Now, uh, turning to Jonas. Uh, we have already touched upon it uh, quite a lot, this link between access, economic growth, uh, job creation. Now, what should be done? What is needed in developing uh, countries uh, that this actually all leads to some decent uh, job creation? Jonas. 
Thank you very much. And I think I can touch upon some of the aspects that have already been mentioned by my other dear panel members. I think, um, Nuri, you said there's there's no silver bullet. What, what certainly is true that uh, the number one challenge, uh, especially here in the in the Africa region where I'm, I'm based and I'm, I'm speaking from, is the the lack of available of jobs for a growing youth population. So that's the number one constraint above everything else, above skills. And it goes hand in hand with, of, of course, with um, access to technology, access to electricity, to the internet. But um, what, what is required from an ILO perspective is to see the potential of leveraging digital solutions in the context of job creation more broadly, meaning that investment and macroeconomic policies, they should be geared um, when focused on you know, promoting technologies, should be geared towards sectors, occupations that promise to be rich in terms of job grow, uh, growth and that can um, you know, bring home the promise that increased technology, increased reliance of capital will also result in, in substantial job growth. And that's not always what we have seen in the past. Oftentimes upgrading of technology might, uh, might not uh, lead on a net basis to, to more jobs. So it's very careful to look at investment policies, macroeconomic policies, um, even if that means taking a step back when, it, when in terms of deciding on which are really the, the, the sectors that, should, um, uh, that, that we should support for job creation. And that perhaps then leads to, 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 to the second point, what is needed, digital skills. So lo lots have been sa said already. I would say, yes, digital skills are important, but we also need to ask the, the question. And I would say, from my perspective, to also make it perhaps a little bit more interesting on, on the panel, we, we should really critically question every single skills development program and ask, are, are, is this program training young people for jobs that are out there? Yes or no. And I think there is a lot of enthusiasm around um, also the development partner community to invest in digital skills, yet not always there are jobs, let alone decent jobs, awaiting these young, young graduates. So I think that needs also a little bit of a careful recalibration. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but I think we should do it in a way that is a little bit um, honest to ourselves in terms of what our opportunities. And I think that brings me to the third, uh, perhaps last point I'd, I'd like to make for now, which is um, regulation and public policy. So if we look at what are some of the jobs out there, many of those are um, around the growing platform economy, which has been growing five times in the past decade, has been also um, you know, with a focus, of course, on, on, on developed countries, but also in the Africa region, in Nigeria, for example, platforms have grown massively, the platform economy. So that, that's both online and web-based platforms where workers would perform tasks such, such as micro work, but also software development, freelance work, but then, of course, also location-based platforms. And everybody knows, ranging from ride hailing, from um, offering uh, services more broadly, other types of services to, um, um, to e-commerce e and, and, and finance applications, right? And if we look at the type of jobs that this platform economy, to kind of put it all in one basket, um, create, then we see that there, there, there are major concerns in terms of the, the types of jobs that, that can be created uh, um, and uh, specifically about the, the type of career tra tra trajectories that are then available to young people. So for example, just um, to, to use one example as an illustration, there's a risk for highly trained young people that then end up in software or micro task work on platforms where they have very little opportunity to grow and progress and very little agency about, uh, about their work and their, you know, so, let's say social security situation is very unclear. And that creates that has the tendency then to perhaps even further amplify existing digital divides in terms of the global now uh, between the global south and the global north, where uh, perhaps a qualified workforce in, in the global south does work on online platforms for companies elsewhere under terms and conditions that are um, at best not, not defined very clearly. So let me stop here and just saying that harnessing digi and digital technologies and leading to decent job creation in developing countries. And here, let's say in the Africa region more specifically, doesn't only require investments in the region, but it also requires a conversation yeah. um, at, the, at the global level on how do we want to regulate and how we want to perhaps better work for regulate could be managed. How do we want to manage that digital transformation 
in a way that is not as to use borrow one word than Nigeria you used that is not extractive but that is um, uh, resulting in, in mutual benefits so let me leave it here for the time being and Theresa hand back I hand back over to you I'm sure we can have a rich discussion um, based on this yeah, so am I, Jonas, and thank you very much for that. And again, another reality check, actually, uh, you brought uh, in this discussion. I would like to uh, encourage uh, participants uh, to use the chat uh, to really be part of this conversation. Uh, Andriana is there to, uh, to check it, so uh, feel free uh, to use that channel. But I would at this uh, point like to uh, give the opportunity to other uh, panelists to react, actually, on some selected points that, uh, that other speakers have raised. Uh, Jovan, shall I start with you? There are quite a few very interesting points, and uh, thank you for bringing it. Uh, definitely, no, uh, the question is not either skill or institution, we need both. But uh, I guess that in uh, so far in capacity development, there was a stronger focus on skill, uh, skill building, less on institutions. That was just, that needs a bit of a recalibration. And what Jonas said was, was, uh, was really important is the question of policies and question of, of um, um, uh, providing uh, some reasonable regulation. And I'll give you one example, which affects many small and African countries uh, and this question of competition policy. Usually uh, in uh, African countries, you don't have a competition authorities like you have in European Union or United States or uh, China or bigger countries, which makes uh, small businesses, uh, um, traditional businesses, potentially vulnerable to big uh, um, uh, foreign uh, platforms. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a need to have uh, to help uh, small and developing countries to have more balanced approach towards economic growth, which won't endanger the local fabric when it comes to jobs, when it comes to uh, small businesses. And this is, uh, they don't have, uh, very often they don't have a power to face big companies. Uh, let's say uh, the only place probably apart from United States and China is Brussels, which can challenge the uh, tech companies when it comes to data regulation, competition policy, and other issues. Therefore, there is a need to uh, do to have micro measures when it comes to skills, capacity development, but also to be aware of the limits of the, these micro uh, measures, given the relatively limited power of the of the small and developing countries to um, to promote and protect their interests when it comes to the social and economic development. And this is extremely, extremely important. I mentioned competition policy, definitely data policy is one important area, uh, but you can also go into the, into the question of latest uh, AI developments, also cybersecurity, which is becoming not only security, but economic issues. The list is long, but that's what, uh, uh, what is a concern, at least for us at, uh, at Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo Foundation, is that uh, small and developing countries are not part of the global uh, uh, discussions and negotiations, and they are uh, uh, more on the receiving side of the global policies, with very limited possibility to influence what's going what's going on. Which is not only the question of uh, uh, let's say justice or unfairness, but it's also a very practical question. If they don't participate in adopting the, the, those policies, they don't own them and they don't feel comfortable in implementing them. This is, I would say, just echoing on Jonas' point on the policies that I would say is important issue. No, thank you, Jovan. Thanks to Jonas, actually, for, for bringing this up. This indeed is uh, extremely important. Uh, it's very close uh, to the work of the Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo because we, we see this really as an underlying pro problem, that there is not enough participation uh, of uh, uh, policymakers from developing countries really participating in the processes. Uh, substantively. Substantively, exactly, yes. Uh, and... Uh, where is that connected to, again, uh, to some gaps that are actually in capacity building? Yes, because maybe there is not uh, uh, that um, in-house expertise. Uh, uh, and uh, this is something that, uh, that should uh, definitely uh, improve. Uh, thank you. And we might get to it later because I, I see like 10 of other sub-issues that might be possibly connect connected to that. Uh, giving the opportunity uh, to react uh, to what was said to you, Nanjira, now. Not only sure. to Jovan, but also to, to other speakers, of course. Yes. Um, lately, I've also been reflecting on the fact that we need to think about capacity mismatch. 
in sectors like cybersecurity, for example, you find um, in a country like Kenya or even in Nigeria, many of the cyber uh, attacks uh, targeted at, say, financial institutions are conducted by locals. So on one hand, you could think of it that they have the capacity. It's just that the incentives are not aligned for them to fit to the industry um, rather than, you know, go on the dark side, so to speak. That's been one very interesting way to think about it. So that even as we continue to say we're calling for more resources or more programs in capacity, um, we must remember that sometimes also it's that the capacity is there. It's just mismatched to the industries and how they imagine capacity should go into it. Related to this is the notion of formal education as a means of building capacity. And in the tech world, we're realizing more and more self-training and self-taught methods are other ways for people to gain capacity. So for example, if you end up with a very good technically capable young person, would their regulator in sector regulator in their country take them on for the job to, you know, be one of the officers in the CERT, the cyber incidents response team. So a lot of this is also linked to the culture, the culture of formality that um, shapes a lot of our institutions and our bureaucracies um, that, that also obfuscates where we are with the capacity notion. So this is, I think, an, an, an untapped area to reflect on. And it relates to the concept of digital skills and who um, is, is posited as the, the purveyor of the skills and the recipient, the beneficiary and the you know, um, trainer, so to speak. Um, there's something about how we've been talking about digital skilling that still reeks of the same developmentalism. So we have to be worried about that. And in any setting where we, re we design a program, whether it's small scale, or grand scale, just leaving room for the fact that do we actually even ask people when we go into a room with them, saying we're going to train them, whether they're regulators, whether they're small business uh, and, and entrepreneurs, what they do know so that we are tailoring any technical expertise we think we're bringing to the conversation to their own expertise on operational elements. They may know better ways to run cybersecurity in, than we actually think about in how we have structured programs. Lastly, I just wanted to also point out that, Jovan, when you were talking about um, the, the, the participation, especially of developing countries in uh, global policy making, it's not just the small countries. You, you don't see a Kenya and Nigeria pulling their weight um, in these discussions and in these fora. And there we have to think, and, and when that, whether the mechanisms is because there are too many fora for them to participate in, that they cannot distribute themselves, we find that all, all too often, the only tool in the toolbox is to ban, ban platforms. You've seen, uh, you know, Trisha was banned in Nigeria. We see internet shutdowns. And that, that, that gives us room to ask ourselves in platforms like this, in Geneva and other capitals, how do we reach out to our counterparts from these developing countries to bring them along in this journey because all too often when they feel like they've been backed against the corner with the trends that are moving, they go to these uh, options that then punish the user, punish their communities. So that's something else to just frame the fact that there's a lot of work there to be done. Oh, thank you, Nanjira. That was very useful uh, for this discussion as well. Uh, uh, Sulina, would you like to uh, uh, chip in uh, on any of the points, please? Yes. Um Teresa, I'm terribly inspired by all the comments that I'm hearing because this is precisely the problems that we are facing today. You know, what um, Jonas said about policy and regulation and then what Jovan um, added to that. And again, what Nanjira was saying. So, you see, the challenge keeps evolving because technology evolves. And when technology evolves, the digital skills that we require also evolve, right? But let's get back to that question about policy and regulation and about managing their digital space. The truth of the matter is, in the digital space, a policymaker and a regulator try to put artificial barriers in space. And these are artificial barriers by which they are trying to boundaries, actually, artificial boundaries, because they're trying to regulate or manage these applications and services in a space where it's difficult. And so it's like releasing the Pokemon. So the Pokemons have been released and it's now, you know, you're trying to catch it back. So how do you do that? And that's why it's difficult. And um, policymakers, you're right. I mean, there are many fora which they could participate in. And the fact of the matter is many of them actually come to the ITU. And some of this, the ITU finds it a bit challenging because it we are also dealing and grappling with new things. So what ends up happening is that, as you said, developing uh, nations suddenly take a step back. But sometimes developing nations, and I'm, I'm from one, 
we take a step back intentionally because you also don't want to stifle innovation. So you want your regulations and your policies to be forward looking and you want to only come in when there's a market failure. The point is though, there are very few tools for you to use apart from having something like maybe the GDPR, which is extraterritorial in nature. And if a small nation were to put something extraterritorial in their legislation, how would that be if you were trying to implement that? So there are various challenges and we have to look at it from all kinds of perspectives, I feel. Um, but policy and regulation definitely is the key to everything. Cybersecurity, for instance, you know, this field is suffering from a skills gap. You know, as global demand for, for professionals continues to outpace the supply. And this has been the problem for many, many years. But you know, this will continue because as technology evolves, there will be more loopholes we will find and it will be more difficult to try to manage this space. And you will then need to gather more skills together and put more programs. So you know, it's, it's a cyclic, cyclical thing. And I think it's going to be difficult, but if we don't band together to do it, and which is why I keep on going back to strategic partnerships, if we don't talk together, if we don't sit down and really do something about it, it, it will be difficult, I feel. Thank you. And what exactly could we do uh, together, Solina? Uh, do you have a suggestion? Practically, very practically. Somewhere. Yeah, we have to Sorry? start somewhere. We, we have to start somewhere. And at ITU, we believe in partnership. So we're going big on partnership. And this partnership is, although it's a partnership that we want um, to encourage connectivity, there are, very, there are many aspects to this because it's all about digital transformation, as I said. If you want to go ahead, if you want to find a way to do this, you have to band together. You have to find partners to do different things. You have to first put, put everything on the, on the wall. We have our building blocks and we are trying to work out how best to achieve each building block for each nation that comes to us for help. And so we're putting together a program called Partner to Connect because we believe in this. And for us, this is going to be a game changer at the ITU. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. That was not intentional. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Jonas, uh, could I give you uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to chip in uh, also? Yeah, for sure. And uh, th thanks a lot. Um, Perhaps just to build on what was uh, just just said, um, what what can be done in 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 practice? And I would say, well, one um, one should also be clear in in those global uh, discussions around the um, digital transformation about opportunities, but also risks. One should also be clear about what can be done at the global level, at the regional level, at the country level. And it's not the case that. Uh, because there are some challenges that can only be solved at, uh, at, at the global level when it comes about, for, for example, putting boundaries and regulations on uh, the global platform economy, that there is nothing that national regulators could, could do. And when we, when we look, for example, in, at a job creation that is happening at the national level, we do see also in developing countries, also in countries um, here in the region, the risk of increased labor market polarization between a segment of workers, young workers that are highly qualified, they're sought after that can kind of work in the global economy and then others that are relegated to uh, working on uh, local platforms, competing with existing businesses, most prominently ride hailing, but there's also many other platforms where essentially um, a new way of um, selling or um, buying services is is replacing or competing with with an existing industry and i think in, the, in those countries there might be in some countries there might be a tendency to say well let's not stifle development let's not stifle investments let uh, let let the market um, decide but the truth of the matter is that oftentimes workers are kind of at the end of the food chain and aren't necessarily benefiting from better incomes or living conditions, or at least it is not something that should be taken for granted. So I think one, one um, message is that it is also up to that countries can do and uh, regulators, policymakers, they can make choices. They, they can, and, and, and the, the, the choice they have is not to ban an industry or to let it grow, but, but to manage that growth and to make uh, sure that that uh, labor market polarization is avoided to the extent possible and that jobs that are created are 
in fact coming with um, you know a decent wage um, right to um, socially bargain to organize themselves all these are contentious issues also by the way in developed countries and so, so, I, so I think that is also uh, something where there could be a platform for dialogue and, and exchange rather than one party telling the other uh, how, how to get it right. So that, that's uh, one thing. And then very concretely, because uh, Sulia, you've been mentioning partnerships. One partnership the ILO is, is having is precisely with the International Telecommunications Union in Africa on um, boosting decent jobs for young people in the digital economy across uh, six pilot countries where we have this year now started to you know, um, put our um, money where our mouth is and, and implement some uh, pilot action around precisely bridging this gap between digital skills on the one hand and entrepreneurship and job creation opportunity on the other hand. And we have not done that alone or even started alone, but designed these programs and activities very closely together with the six countries that we are working in. And Nigeria, that goes back to one of the, the important points that you made before that um, programs that interventions that try to stimulate um, the uptake of digital innovations. So in this case, very specifically with the goal for you know job creation for for young people, they need to be demand driven. That means consultations with um, with with government, with implementers, but also importantly, young people who are at at the heart of of this specific partnership we are having with the ITU and the African Union, and importantly. The constituents across across six pilot countries. So that's just to say, to to bring um, to illustrate one concrete instance in where we are taking action in the spirit of um, scaling up partnerships that that has been mentioned. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jonas, for bringing this very concrete uh, cooperation example um, back to us. Yes. Uh, now, I would like to turn to Andriana, uh, our chat moderator, uh, to see what has been uh, going on in the chat. Andriana, could you give us a brief update, please? And we cannot hear you. That's because I haven't clicked on mute, so that makes perfect right. sense. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as sort of a representative for, for our audience that is chatting at the moment. Um, we have uh, three comments so far. Uh, and a fourth one by yours truly. Uh, Tobion has uh, said that Nanjira and Johan made good points in their first interventions, noting that UNCTAD's support on e-trade readiness assessments and e-commerce strategy development evolved close collaboration which e with each member state and different stakeholder groups in order to strengthen the institutional aspect and long-term sustainability. Another comment that Tobin made was on partnership uh, and noting that E-Trade for All is another example aimed at making it easier for countries to find technical and financial assistance in policy areas that are relevant to e-commerce and the digital uh, economy. Uh, and he also noted that Diplo ITU and ILO are among the partner organizations. Uh, Muleza made two comments, uh, noting that uh, availability of resources is key, and for developing countries, involvement in digital space uh, will take a long time, and that there is a big gap between those who are able and those who uh, can't. And she also underlined uh, partnership and collaboration amongst them between countries in information uh, sharing. And Teresa, when you mentioned the IGF, I shamelessly self-promoted our freshly printed uh, IGF final report. And at this point, I turn it back to you. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much uh, for that, Andriana. I will actually want to come uh, to the IGF uh, uh, in a bit, but uh, now, you know, thank you uh, to, uh, to those comments and inputs. I will uh, probably uh, try to stay um, at the last um, point brought by Melissa on resources, it's something Nigeria uh, has also brought up already. Uh, and I personally see this, uh, and you know, will ask others to reflect um, resources issues on two levels. First is kind of on the political level, like we are talking about the need for capacity building and development. Apologies, uh, we are less talking about where to get resources uh, for this. That's one uh, layer. Another layer, uh, which I'm observing also at the developing uh, countries, 
And that goes more in terms of, the, let's say, basic digital skills, uh, uh, digital literacy training is also some unwillingness uh, because of the limited resources of these countries to invest uh, in uh, building digital skills. So, for instance, if there is a question uh, of building a school or, uh, or investing in training on, uh, on uh, how to use uh, technologies, um, often uh, the choice is um, not so evident. Let's, uh, let's put it this way. But let's first start on the kind of bigger, higher level. How do we ensure more resources for capacity development for developing countries? Jovan. Okay. Uh, let, let me just comment on, on, on one aspect. Uh, recently, uh, well, a few years ago, I got to statistics that only 5% of uh, inputs on Wikipedia are provided on Africa, are provided by people uh, from Africa. Well, we, we can't expect that all people from other continents, but 5% was very little. And then I started finding the reason for it. And one of the reason was that uh, due to the um, uh, salary scheme, for example, professors at universities in Africa prefer, prepare, uh, prefer to publish a book that could add to the income of their resources than to uh, add to the Wikipedia article, which is very legitimate concern. They have to, to earn uh, income for living. Therefore, there are so many tacit, uh, unknown uh, uh, complexities of the social and economic dynamics, like motivation of uh, assistant of professor at the University of Nairobi or any University of Africa, should he or she spend time to add uh, something to Wikipedia or prepare a book uh, that could uh, add to the income. That's basically that element which I think Nanjira started of anchoring it to the really subtle tacit understandings of the local dynamics, which can be done uh, only by locals. When it comes to the major, major resources, uh, I think that uh, there is a general interest and general uh, sort of uh, political will to support uh, capacity development, let's say in Africa and in cybersecurity to take a few, uh, few areas. I uh, think that that has to be managed with much more agility. Development assistance is still managed by big major projects, uh, outcome, output impacts. If you're a small organization and like Diplo, let alone small NGOs in African continent, you simply cannot get easily to that funding because you don't have administrative machinery, funding machinery. And I will close with what, uh, what uh, uh, I forgot her name, but uh, Bezos' former wife is doing currently. Uh, not Melinda. No, sorry. Is, uh, well, I forgot her name. But she's basically uh, providing funding with any uh, a reporting uh, scheme. It's probably too radical, but she says, I find this organization good. Let me risk. It's her personal money. Obviously, it's not public money. And I think that uh, big funders have to simplify that. Otherwise, the funding will go into the big systems and uh, they will be dripping to the real uh, people who can uh, feel the, the difference. Uh, will, they will be at the end of the this long, uh, long chain. I think it's one of the biggest problem in the global funding uh, schemes. Mm. Simplification of funding pro procedure, obviously dealing with the misuse. This is very important, especially for public money. But there are different ways than to have this robust uh, reporting scheme, which can take uh, energy of the small setups and small organizations, which are ultimately should be the carrier of that dynamics on the ground, like startup companies in uh, SME's sector. Because that goes back to the local ownership yeah. that we have had stressed uh, uh, in this session as well. Uh, I put Jovan on the spot because I knew this was a topic close to his heart, but of course, uh, give us a, a, a signal, uh, our dear other speakers, if you would like to uh, come in on this uh, on this question. Uh, I definitely would. Yes, please. That's a surprising <laughs> fact, but go ahead, Nanjira. She's an excellent <laughs> Uh, first and foremost, I think you know it goes back to where I started. But um, 
the, where we start to analyze the issue will make or break the kinds of solutions we do. So in this case, we're not talking, the problem is not so much digital skills. The problem is access to education. In fact, the problem is public funding, sustainable public funding for educational programs. We end up in this situation where we're talking about what Mackenzie Scott does to determine the digital skilling of an entire country, for example, if that's what we're saying, because the resources that should support public, you know, education as a public good have, have, have disintegrated in many parts of the world today so that everything we're doing is piecemeal, you know, on the side. That's why you end up with perverse um, university cultures as we Yovan was trying to illustrate. It's not because people are not thinking about what's happening with the digitalization of these parts of the world, but the incentives at the institutional level have been so misaligned because austerity and other programs that have been running amok in parts of this, of the continent for a better part of, 40 years have gotten us to where we are today. So naturally, there isn't much leapfrogging we can really do through the tech side. And by the way, this is including the fact that people are still teaching themselves by daily use for those who have use, as I was saying. Um, to the very question of, are we trying to say that digital skilling has to be yet another structured um, element. So I really keep coming back to that. Um, so that the resources, as you were talking about, the financial ones are tied fundamentally to the conversation about public goods. And even in digital development, we're talking about digital public goods now, because this is completely aligned to the fact that support for public infrastructure and public goods has been waning across the board. On the political side, I think if we are able to start conversations that get us back to abundance, and especially for developing countries, everybody who's speaking to what they want to bring to developing countries, tools like this, webinars like these, are ways to build, build capacity or exchange insights or peer learning. It just comes, it's whether the institutions, whether it's regulators, whether it's a policy, ministry of ICT or anyone else in the government realm, is letting the actors who are involved, the officers and the civil servants, be creative about how they go about getting these skills. If we keep trying to structure everything, we'll keep having that capacity and financial mismatch that ultimately disincentivizes the political will for actors to participate. Thank you, Nanjira. Uh, excellent points there. Uh, as always, uh, Surina has indicated she would like to chip in and then I go quickly to Andriana. Thank you, um, Teresa. Interesting points, and I, I would like to actually address something that Jovan was saying just now. Um, or was it you, Teresa? You were saying something about basic literacy. I think in many cases, basic literacy is an impediment to digital literacy. And so that's part of the problem, and that's where the education come in, comes in, right? But um, when we're talking about resources, I think financial resources are clear that it's one resource that you know, we, we really should be able to optimize. But in, in order to do that, we need to see what data resources are lacking because only when we have data are we able to pinpoint where the problem is and then put those resources to something that's really required. I mean, one of the biggest challenges that governments face in developing a digital skill strategy or program is often not knowing what exactly the skills gap is. And to know that, it is important to first undertake a skills assessment. And for this, we require data. And it's not often the case that such data is readily available. But countries need this data to address the gap so that their strategies are evidence-based. And, and that's another aspect, I think, of resources that we should also think about. And where the political will comes in is to invest in getting this data so that they can put whatever little resources everybody has at hand to the problem that's really required. Mm. I'll stop there. Thank you. No, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I understand that there is a question in the chat. Uh, Andriana, uh, could you please uh, bring this up? Certainly, Teresa. A question from Alexander is, uh, how do different initiatives work together with academia in different countries? And to clarify that further, the idea is to understand how Diplo, ITU, ILO in their efforts are looking for collaborations with universities? That would be the question. And uh, that's a good one. We actually have not mentioned the academic sector uh, properly uh, yet uh, in this discussion. Uh, is there a speaker? And I can see Jonas's hand uh, that would like to pick this up. Uh, you have the floor, Jonas. Many thanks. Yeah, that's a great point. Very important um, for different reasons. First, I, I couldn't agree more with what was said before in terms of needing 
evidence and where investments are needed, but also which approaches work best. What we are doing right now together with ITU and our constituents in uh, three countries, Kenya, Nigeria, and South, South Africa, is conducting so-called digital skills supply and demand assessments uh, right now as we speak. And uh, with, with the idea, so um, research exercises with, with a view to advising programming and understanding what exactly are digital skills gaps, how can could they best be filled, and what are young people that are working, what are they actually doing? How are they actually using their digital skills right now? We are doing that in all three countries together with uh, research partners, um, in some cases, universities. Certainly, we will when we have findings available, we will ensure a broad discussion, including with, with academic partners. And I think that um, is an important aspect, just that it shouldn't go unmentioned, that developing capacities doesn't mean to bring in expertise, especially when we talk about analytical expertise. I think it very much means involving the, the partners, the universities, and the research centers that um, that that we we have here in the region available, and they are they are already abundant. They are um, many experts focusing on on those topics. There there's great institutes like Digital Bridge Institute in Nigeria and other countries um, that are specifically focused on areas such as digital transformation, and that need to be need to be part of part of this process and. So we also need to get away a little bit without um, evoking too much of a stereotype by um, saying, well, the implementation is, ha is happening together with local partners, but for all the analytical part, kind of bring in experts from, from, from outside um, because, because that is not sustainable and, and, and we need to also generate a substantial uh, you know, follow-up, a critical, a critical observation, analytical work of, of the academic, of, of academia here in the region and across other developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, Jovan has given me a sign. Uh, he would like to come in. Just three quick points. OK. <laughs> One, first, uh, M-Pesa is the result paying system in Kenya of local wisdom and great regulatory co coordination in Kenya. If you go to the Google search, a uh, search for M-Pesa, uh, you can find, last time I was searching, only on 20th position, one article written by somebody from Kenya. And uh, that's a bit of a problem. And I already raised with people from Google, let's promote, it's a local wisdom. It was invented in Kenya. It's part of the local dynamics. Let's have also academics from Kenya uh, uh, writing about it. The second point, we are going to share with the wider community idea of having some sort of digital research fairs at the universities we did it in Amsterdam in the past. You go for one week at the university cafeteria, make a posters and raise the awareness of people to do research on digital law, economy, and the other aspects. Raise the, some sort of dynamics. That fairs could be organized uh, in other places. Uh, definitely in Europe, there is a lack of it uh, in the in developed world in general, but also in Africa. And third point, which we are now brainstorming, is to have a, a special, uh, let's say, fellowships for researchers who come to Geneva and uh, uh, have a cross-cutting fellowship when they will spend maybe 10 days at the ITU, sometimes at ILO, at uh, CERN, at different places, and get the cross-cutting holistic approach to academic and policy research, which will be the make or break on the future of digital policy. Therefore, three, three points. Let's have MPESA higher on the Google search. Second, let's organize the digital research fairs at universities in developing countries. And third point, let's have a special fellowships for the PhD students and researchers who will be immersed into cross-cutting discussions, which are already happening in this really rich environment in Geneva. Thank you very much, Jovan, for that. Uh, uh, I mean, inclusion of uh, academics, students at universities, uh, let's face it, will have uh, quite an impact and spillover effect and nurturing this kind of cross-cutting view of issues that they might be studying totally different disciplines, but kind of exploring the digital aspects in these other uh, disciplines uh, is definitely welcome development. Then I do encourage others to check if you is right, that if you Google MPESA, wherever you are, 
because we might be getting different results uh, depending uh, on, on where we are located, uh, whether you do get uh, resources on Google, uh, academic resources by, written by African, ideally, uh, Kenyan, uh, Kenyan uh, researchers. I can see Nanjira is browsing now. Nanjira is browsing, yes. She has a very, very focused, uh, focused look, uh, definitely. Well, uh, I am afraid we are slowly coming to the close of the first segment uh, of this event. Please do not disconnect because we will be continuing. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the speakers in the first segment, uh, obviously, uh, to our ladies, uh, Selina and Nanjira. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, to Jovan uh, joining me here in our ConfTech Lab uh, uh, Geneva Internet Platform uh, Studio in Geneva, as well as, of course, Jonas uh, joining us uh, from, uh, from Abidjan. Uh, this was, as I said at the beginning, uh, the last uh, event uh, in the series from Geneva, uh, Reflections uh, on the Digital Future. And we will now continue with a high-level segment, uh, which will feature four prominent speakers. And this segment uh, is organized and will be delivered by our partners of this series, uh, the permanent uh, the delegation of the uh, European Union uh, to the United Nations um, here in Geneva. And this segment will be moderated by Ambassador uh, Lotte Knudsen, who is the permanent representative of EU here in Geneva. With this, thank you once again. Uh, stay with us. And I'm passing the floor uh, to uh, another Geneva uh, post here and to Ambassador Knudsen. Over to you and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Teresa, for this <clears throat> very smooth transition. And it's very good to see, as you say, our good partners from Geneva Internet Platform at the other end, you, Teresa, and Jovan, uh, of course. Um, and um, I have been listening into some of your uh, some of your exchanges, and I can clearly see that it's been a very, very good, very, very rich debate. But first of all, a big uh, good afternoon to everybody, and good morning, as I know some colleagues from uh, New York have joined us uh, as well. And I'm very, very happy to be uh, here with you today. Uh, for this interesting uh, dialogue that has spanned over a couple of months and where different episodes have touched upon different uh, issues, but always to sort of try to highlight the, the positive aspects uh, of the role of new and emerging technologies and their impact upon their lives, but from a, uh, a beneficial point of view, what benefits, what added value, in a positive way do they bring to our life? And that's been sort of the red thread which has run through all four debates uh, that have taken place. We've been covering a lot of uh, ground, uh, data economy, artificial intelligence and health, environmental protection, uh, as well as the development subject uh, of today. And I think that goes to show the, the, the richness of the digital uh, subject, which is not one monolithic theme, but indeed has to be broken down into all the normal policies uh, and uh, activ activities of uh, governance today. So the idea was to have a sort of reflections on the digital future in a broad sense, to pull together a lot of different strands, uh, and also sort of highlight <clears throat> what we here in Geneva can do about it. As Jorba knows, that is one of my big themes. How is it that the whole Geneva ecosystem, which is very, very rich in the digital area, can also uh, make a, a contribution to um, this uh, debate. I mean, we all know that the discussions that take place on digital infrastructure and connectivity um, bring a lot of new uh, opportunities, be it for individuals, small and medium-sized businesses, women, youth, rural community. There are a lot of good things to be had from the digital um, uh, transition. Uh, and we know that in terms of, of rights and freedoms, it's also a major uh, enabler because it uh, allows so many more people uh, to reach out, to be aware, to gain insights, which would otherwise uh, have been too, uh, too remote or not accessible. So it allows a lot of different social positions to come out a lot of community groups to be involved uh, at global level where before it would have been remained very, very local and that without the visibility and accountability uh, that this can bring. <clears throat> but there are also risks involved, of course, in technological advances, which we should never uh, <clears throat> try to conceal. 
And the digital space has also, in many ways, uh, amplified the vulnerabilities uh, of different groups and aspects of our society and exposed uh, the weaknesses. So the question is sort of how can we all work together to balance these two sides, get the best <clears throat> out of digital uh, transition and developments, while yet uh, ring fencing the potential uh, risks and even dangers in some uh, in some cases. And what what are the responsibilities of the various stakeholders? Given that we always talk about a multi-stakeholder uh, approach. What is the, the, the perspective? What are the responsibilities uh, of those who try to harness new technologies uh, and, and innovations to ensure that they truly serve our citizens? Um, but our task here today is sort of to wrap up uh, these episodes that have taken place over the last couple of months uh, and just sort of try to round up uh, and conclude. And for that purpose, we have uh, brought uh, together four well-known and distinguished uh, guests who have been working in the area of new technologies and are eminently placed, I think, to conclude uh, the series of our discussions uh, and share their opinions on, on how they see the digital future. So we have four guest speakers uh, representing UN, EU and the EU presidency, as well as that leading digital country that is Switzerland. So I will I will start at the uh, at the beginning with the UN, which is my uh, good friend and and, and colleague uh, Marie Francesca Stavlisano, who is currently Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination uh, in the UN in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, DESA. Uh, and Francesca, it's great to see you, even if uh, virtually. And it would be great if you could perhaps say a few words about how you see. Uh, the contribution that the global uh, system can make or that can be made at a global level uh, to digital uh, issues and how you think that the common agenda of the Secretary General and other e UN initiatives can help uh, tackle the broader digital uh, issue. Over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Lotte, indeed. Uh, dear friend Lotte and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to join you today for the conclusion of the series from Geneva, Reflections on Digital Future. I speak to you in my capacity as officer in charge of the Tech Envoy Office of the Secretary General. Uh, and uh, I have to say that uh, the topics that have been addressed uh, during the series are key timely issues uh, uh, that will impact our lives, rights, livelihoods of people around the world for the foreseeable future. For instance, you take uh, AI, the topic of uh, harnessing AI power for health you discussed. It presents tremendous promise for people's well-being, but as we know, AI can also be hampered by biases and uh, misdiagnoses or target vulnerable uh, uh, populations for discrimination uh, and have uh, harmful consequences. Similar opportunities and concerns arise from data economy, another topic you addressed in this series. So as you know, and as Lotte was uh, mentioning, the Secretary General has uh, uh, expressed uh, a number of views and proposals on these uh, subjects. So the need to harness the potential of the digital technologies and mitigating at the same time the risks was addressed firstly in the report of the Secretary General's high level panel for digital cooperation and subsequently in the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, which was issued last year, beginning of last year. Uh, the roadmap provides recommendations, both within and outside the United Nations system. And I appreciate very much the contributions many of your institutions are already making to implement these roadmap recommendations. And I especially value the focus on taking a human rights centered approach to many of these key issues, ensuring in a way that as we connect all people in the digital age, we also 
make sure that we respect and protect them as well. So excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the international community has recognized the urgent need for cooperation on digital technologies. At last year's uh, uh, UN General Assembly, for the first time, the heads of states and government at the commemoration of the UN 75th anniversary committed to improving digital cooperation. And they noted, and this is a quote, the United Nations can provide a platform for all stakeholders to participate in such deliberation. So taking into account uh, these inputs and the declaration, the United Nations Secretary General issued his report, Our Common Agenda, in September this year. This report provides the Secretary General's vision on the future of global cooperation and aims at the same time at reinvigorating inclusive, networked, and effective multilateralism. On digital technologies, the agenda, the common agenda, calls for a summit of the future to be held in 2023, which will include a multi-stakeholder technology track. Here we come to our topic and leading this track, leading to a global digital compact. This compact, we see it as a special opportunity for governments, the private sector and civil society to come together and agree on what kind of digital future we want. The shape and substance of the compact will depend on the stakeholders, of course. At this stage, is kind of a blank slate. However, the common agenda has suggested that it could cover areas such as universal connectivity, internet, avoiding the internet fragmentation, the regulation of AI and the human rights online. And some of these areas relate to the topics you have discussed during the series. So yours is a really valuable input. And indeed in preparing the compact, the, the role of Geneva, given its specialized expertise and numerous digital policy making processes there, will be critically important. The Office of the Envoy of Technology will coordinate the consultations on the proposed digital compact. And we are in fact already working closely with Geneva-based UN entities and institutions like ITU or the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to see how key upcoming events and processes can build and contribute towards the digital compact. So as we prepare for the summit of the future and the global digital compact, it is vital to engage all stakeholders. And this is a particular challenge, given that most uh, current systems of global governance are state-led and focused on member states. And moreover, not all international bodies, much less the decision-making processes, are open no, to civil society organizations or the very companies that are developing these technologies. So, or even uh, and even more in New York, uh, uh, the nature of discussion and decision making uh, uh, often means the process is very complicated and fraught. And this is why I appreciate the strong positions that many of you have taken in support of multilateral and multi-stakeholder approaches to digital issues, which the Secretary General and the Office of the Envoy on Technology are deeply committed to and practice constantly, as you know, those of you who participate in the roundtables. Uh, last uh, week, even, uh, again, at the Katowice Internet Governance Forum that many of you may have uh, followed and some were also participating in, uh, a range of stakeholders were convened around from around the world to address the issues and in a very bottom-up approach. But this multi-stakeholderism cannot be taken for granted. And in fact, it requires constant political support and reinforcement. And in concluding, I will reiterate that an open and free internet can and must be global in nature so let us resist the growing trends towards internet fragmentation, pressures to create silos within the online space, and also the temptation to retreat into exclusive like-minded clubs in a fractured world, online world, 
we would all be worse off. Instead, let's use the Secretary General proposal for a global digital compact as the ideal place where we will all convene and agree together around our common objective of an open, free and secure digital future for all. And I count on you, agents, agencies, missions, organizations and the people in Geneva to be part of this movement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, and also for reminding us that many of the principles we, uh, we consider as the basis for uh, internet system and internet governance should not be taken for granted, and that perhaps it's a multilateral system which can indeed uphold this rule book of principles via some of the ambitious ideas you have on the table. So thank, thanks a million, uh, Francesca. And then I'll then move on to a very good uh, colleague from the EU, uh, Mr. Eamon uh, Gilmore, who is the EU Special Representative uh, on, uh, on Human Rights uh, of the European Union, which uh, leads him um, onto many different uh, parts of human rights, many visits, the involvement in a lot of issues, including uh, high tech and particularly sort of the uh, the human rights based aspect, which is, of course, something in the European Union we very much prize. But uh, perhaps for you, Eamon, the whole question of how do you, in this sort of human rights uh, based approach, uh, tackle the more negative trends and tendencies we also see in terms of call it disinformation, misinformation in the form, for instance, of hate speech or discrimination online that become more and more common? Over to you, Eamon. Thank you very much, Lottie, and good afternoon from uh, from Brussels. Uh, I want to thank you and thank the EU delegation in Geneva, uh, thank the permanent missions of Slovenia, the Presidency, Switzerland, and the uh, Geneva Internet Platform for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, my role is promoting human rights in the external action and the foreign policy uh, of the European Union, so I'll confine my remarks to uh, to that angle, and of course, digital issues are increasingly at the forefront uh, of contemporary foreign policy debates. Geneva in particular, where you are, uh, has become something of a hub for international discussions on digital issues and on the future face of digital technologies. And indeed, I think Geneva has turned into be something of a battleground between different approaches to different to, to digital technologies. And from the European Union's perspective, uh, the battle is to secure a human rights approach uh, to the future of new technologies. I think it is probably true to say that the development and the use of new technologies have moved so fast uh, that the implications for people, the human rights implications, uh, has lagged somewhat behind. And I think it is time <clears throat> to put that right, to put the rights and needs of people back in charge of the technology, uh, because new technologies must serve people uh, rather than the other way around. The next year, I think, will be very important. Uh, the International Telecommunications Union will host key conferences and elections. Uh, the newly created multi-stakeholder Internet Governance Forum um, uh, leadership panel uh, will start its work bringing uh, diverse perspectives to Internet issues. Uh, and the UN Human Rights Council will continue engaging on tech-related questions, uh, which has been an integral part of its agenda. The European Union will work hard on all of these fronts. Uh, we cooperate closely with the OHCHR on digital issues. Uh, the EU has been involved in the elaboration of the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation um, to seize the opportunities of new technologies uh, and to mitigate the risks, we consider that it is of utmost importance to identify joint actions in the multilateral fora involving civil society, involving private actors uh, and all states uh, in the discussions. And we're looking forward to cooperating closely with the new, uh, the new uh, UN tech envoy as soon as uh, he or she is appointed. Uh, the European Union has a long record of standing up for human rights worldwide because we see human rights as universal, belonging to all people uh, everywhere. Uh, human rights are the best antidote to violence and conflict. They're key to peace, to stability, uh, human security, uh, sustainable development. 
uh, and we're a vocal advocate of human rights in the world um, in terms of our funding, in terms of the diversity of the instruments that we use, uh, efforts ranging from bilateral human rights dialogues. We have about 60 of them uh, every year. Uh, we use it in our trade preferences, in election observations, emergency grants to human rights defenders, um, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, the use of uh, human rights sanctions. With the emergence of cyberspace and digital technologies, uh, new human rights dilemmas and um, questions have come to the fore. Um, and our approach has been to address these as core human rights issues which apply online as well as offline. In many respects, the, the, the human right at issue uh, is not different. It's just that the platform on which uh, it has to be exercised is different. Internet shutdowns, for example, are really today's incarnation of old style, crude censorship of media. Mass surveillance, targeted arbitrary surveillance, including facial recognition and the notorious uh, Pegasus spyware um, are, uh, what, uh, are, are breaches of the right of, uh, of privacy. Um, they're not new. Uh, this is just, in many ways, uh, uh, digital spying, uh, digital peeping through the keyhole, invading the privacy uh, of people. Hate speech is not new, but uh, online, I think that it has uh, gathered uh, a new momentum because, of course, it can uh, spread information at an unprecedented uh, speed. And then, of course, there are the multiple digital gaps which exist across countries and uh, social groups which need to be addressed uh, as really part of the process uh, of addressing uh, poverty uh, and marginalizations. These are the new human rights uh, realities, and the European Union has been adapting to them, uh, recalibrating some of our policy strategies. The new European Union Action Plan on Human Rights and Democracy, which was adopted unanimously by all of our 27 uh, member states just a year ago, recognizes new technologies as one of the key five priority areas for external human rights uh, policies. It's not all negative because the European Union strives to harness the potential of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, for the better enjoyment of human rights, as well as to tackle challenges uh, connected with the rise of digital technologies, both at home and in our external action. Uh, by all actors, our action plan states, digital technologies must be human centred. And indeed, the Human Rights Council has repeatedly underlined that human rights must apply both online and offline. But in the face of digital advances, uh, I don't think it's necessary for us to redefine uh, human rights. Um, new and emerging technologies may indeed be sophisticated, but the key human rights principles are simple, and that is that the same rights, whether we're talking about political rights, uh, civil rights, economic, social, or cultural rights, uh, individuals uh, already have offline, these must be protected online as well. And this is also the approach which has guided uh, the development of the European Union's own internal regulation. Over the last few years, we've established strong standards of protecting data privacy through the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR regime, as it is more popularly known, uh, or indeed on combating hate speech online, where we have a code of conduct uh, negotiated with the social media platforms. The GDPR has become something of a global benchmark, and uh, a legislative process is now underway on a new Digital Services Act, which aims to provide for a clear set of due diligence obligations for online platforms. A key objective in this is to improve user safety online while improving the protection of their fundamental rights. Currently, the European Union is also preparing legislation on artificial intelligence with human rights-based rules re regulating its design, development, uh, deployment, evaluation, and use. So in today's complex, intertwined, and at sometimes chaotic uh, digital world, which is transnational by nature, uh, it is important to connect the dots and stakeholders, and each of us has a stake here. It's not only states and uh, corporate uh, tech giants. Uh, the European Union supports a multi-stakeholder model bringing together civil society, human rights defenders, 
national authorities, academia, international organizations, uh, and the private sector. Uh, and I'm convinced that a robust human rights uh, framing of uh, digital issues is the only formula which will enable us to have a sustainable uh, development of technology which serves all of humanity. Thank you very much, Lottie. Thank you so much, uh, Eamon, for this uh, human-centric perspective on digital, which is, of course, what the EU uh, is standing up for, but also demonstrating how um, human rights can be applied to the new frontiers, um, such as all aspects of, of, of digital, which means that human rights are a, a constant that can be applied not a relative value, as we know, but a constant that can apply uh, to the world as it evolves around us. So thank you very much uh, for that, Eamon. And then I will have the honour to move on to the uh, EU presidency, uh, which is Slovenia. I'm very happy to welcome Ambassador Tadej uh, Rupel, uh, who is uh, who's joined us, who is the national coordinator for expert, external aspects of digitalization. Uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I can only congratulate my Slovenian colleague for the success of this presidency, not least uh, on the digital front, where I think you have been a front runner in many ways, and where we have extremely good cooperation with your delegation here, who is equally active on digital. But over, uh, over to you, Ambassador, uh, in order perhaps to say a few words about your priorities for the presidency and how you think that here in Geneva, we can also best carry them forward uh, into um, the next uh, and the following presidency to ensure some continuity. Over to you, Ambassador. Uh, dear Ambassador Knudsen, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for uh, organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, very important discussion on digital future, as, as you mentioned, Slovenia is, uh, has been steering the will of the European Union uh, uh, as the presidency of the Council uh, of the EU for the last uh, five and a half months. And uh, as you have pointed out, a special emphasis uh, has been put uh, on digital affairs. In my response to your answer, of course, I would like to focus on three main digital topics that uh, have been related throughout our presidency program E. Uh, at the same time, these topics uh, correspond with main activities in the field of digital in Geneva. It basically also with three UN pillars. These are digital development, digi digital rights and principles, and digital security. As you know, U European Union has been uh, focusing on the digital transformation uh, of the uh, Union uh, for, you know, for the last few months or for few years, and especially with the focus to, to have a next decade uh, shaped within our digital compass 2030. So this is our strategic document, how to move Europe forward in our digital uh, transformation. So in the process, uh, we have learned that, that uh, real digital trans trans transformation begins with the trust of citizens and businesses, and that the overall impact of new technologies and digitalization is a topic that increasingly demands our full attention. So this bring, brings me to my first point uh, concerning digital development. On one hand, the, the pandemic uh, has shown that uneven digital development has widened the digital divide, including the gender digi digital divide and that questions of digital inclusion, literacy and access uh, need to be addressed adequately. At this stage, it is, it is important to stress that internal and external dimensions of our policies, mm -hmm. policies in terms of digitalizations are intervened mm -hmm. and that the multi-stakeholder approach uh, to digital development is key. It is therefore necessary to enhance digital cooperation and partnership with stakeholders, countries, regions outside of the EU as digital development does not stop at national borders. As an example of good practice, uh, let me mention that Digital for Development, D4D hubs, in particular D4D hub for Latin America and Caribbean was launched just this week, uh, where our presidency together with European Commission is especially active. D4D hubs, for example, are important uh, for 
to coordinate mechanisms that aim to step up the dialogues and partnership of EU partner countries to promote a human-centric model and digital transition. Another example, Geneva is a place where plethora of important development organizations are active and we are happy to have a very productive collaboration with the ITU development sector uh, that is active in Europe as well as in other re regions. So to move on on my second point, human rights and digital environment. This starts all with trust. So while it is in the EU interest to preserve uh, its technological advancement and to ensure that Europeans can benefit, benefit from uh, digitalization, it is also crucial that new technologies and applications are developed and functioning according to the EU values and principles. The impact of new technologies and digitalization uh, on human rights and freedoms is becoming uh, a topic that is increasingly um, demands our full attention. And rapid development of breakthrough technologies present also many opportunities as well as a number of potential risks. So we are a, a staunch supporter of the need to adopt a human right based approach. Uh, throughout all of our digital transformation efforts in order to achieve a meaningful, inclusive and uh, sustainable digital connectivity. Of course, as, as mentioned uh, before, which promotes human rights and fundamental freedoms and which allows everyone to access and, uh, the secure, innovative, stable, open and free cyberspace. So we are glad to see that during our presidency, Debates on the Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles have been held within the Council, that the aim of this declaration, which will be uh, prepared by the European Commission and which is envisaged in the Digital Compass, it is better to inform people working in the digital environment by providing, of course, a guide for policymakers and, and digital operators. It's also of great importance uh, for us to see uh, and support the work of the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner in Geneva, focusing on privacy, new technologies, internet and implementation of businesses and human rights agenda in the tech industry. So lastly, uh, turning to my last third point, security aspect, as the piece, um, uh, and the new pace of the digital transformation is accelerating across the globe. Digital, uh, or namely cybersecurity, uh, is also becoming increasingly important here in the EU, uh, as well as in, during the Slovenian pres presidency, we pursue uh, this ambition approach. So a strong emphasis on the cybersecurity serves as a cornerstone of a digital agenda. And it's also indispensable to the, to the development of a smarter and greener technology in the post-pandemic world. Uh, let me say at the end that, of course, recent cyber attacks have demonstrated in particular that increased uh, pervasiveness of ransomware and cyber espionage operations and their growing risk for all sectors of the economy uh, and society is, is um, very um, strong. So I think that accordingly to our EU cybersecurity strategy for the digital decade from December last year, we aim to build the resilience uh, to cyber threats and so on. I would just like to mention the uh, NIS directive, which we uh, also put through uh, on, in further stage. This is the director on, directive on measures for a high common level of cybersecurity across the union. And this uh, is, of course, uh, our uh, legislative process to explore further how to enhance our, our uh, security of the information uh, systems. Uh, last but not least, the UN processes. Um, currently, I'm in New York, so we'll probably you hear the, the beeping outside. I'm sorry for that, but uh, we, we are in the middle of the open-ended working group sessions uh, uh, to uh, which are now convening, which deals with uh, a responsible state behavior in cyberspace and six practical tools how to prevent the use of ICTs, information communication technologies, by states in a manner that is in inconsistent with their international obligations. So I would just like to give um, the importance that uh, Slovenia pays 
also in other areas uh, that the cyberspace uh, and security of cyberspace uh, in, in the other uh, international investigations are of course, and other regional organizations, states and stakeholders are of, of high importance. So to, to wrap up all three dimensions I mentioned are crucial uh, to have a stable, open, free and uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, cyberspace and future uh, prosperous digital development. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Rupel. I think you've been one of the front runners as a digital ambassador within EU as well, and it has added uh, considerable uh, value having one front person who pulls together all the strands and digital the way you have uh, done just now. So uh, thank you very much. And then finally, I move on uh, to our last speaker, Ambassador Benedict Bexler, who is a digital ambassador uh, for Switzerland. And again, I think Switzerland is one of the avant-garde countries uh, in the whole digital transformation area. Not only do you have a digital ambassador, but I think you, Switzerland was also one of the first countries to introduce an overall uh, digital strategy as part of your foreign policy. And that is, of course, as has been said by speakers, where we should position uh, digital and new technologies as an essential element of foreign policy. But over to you, uh, Ambassador Bexler. Susan Tuck, Lotte, thank you so much. And I'm privileged to be uh, among this um, uh, great panel, concluding panel. And let me really first thank you, the European Union, the presidency, but also um, the Geneva internet, internet platform for organizing this uh, series over the last few months. And as has been said by my Slovenian colleague, you know, I think Geneva, the great advantage is also, it is a, a window to the world uh, where we can bring also in our European perspectives, European values, and I think it's 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 a very important place uh, to work on that, and to see also the European Union, the presidencies uh, being engaged in in strengthening Geneva as a, as the European voice um, in this uh, also in the digital world. I think it's it's very important. Um, and I also see this only as a start uh, to future and more intense uh, collaboration. Um, being a, a host state also to the UN organizations, um, I, we really see Geneva as a very operational and concrete implementer of the sort of the big strategic decisions that have been taken in, in New York or elsewhere. Um, and, you know, one of the first, uh, of course, uh, great opportunities is the, the digital cooperation roadmap from the Secretary General that I think it's going to be one of our priorities also as Switzerland to help implement that uh, with all the force and uh, the expertise that is around in, uh, in, in Geneva. And again, I think I really want to stress that uh, the human-centered approach for me is also, it's a very practical approach. People have to see and feel directly, you know, what is this digital age uh, bringing to me personally? Um, <clears throat> and that's also, I think I want to uh, just dwell on a little bit now in my concluding remarks, giving you, giving you maybe four examples, very specific examples that I, that I see where we could strengthen our collaboration. A human-centered approach, I think we can only call it a human-centered approach if we also make sure that all human beings have access to this digital world. And we all know this is not the case today. And we have to work on that digital divide and assuring a, a, a global connectivity um, to the, the internet and, and all its uh, enabling functions. And let me just mention there the GIGA initiative. I think it's very, very important. It's very concrete, very specific. It's for the future. It's for the youth. It's for the schools. And I really would like to underline um, the, our thanks for the uh, initiative by the uh, uh, the ITU and the, um, uh, the, the ILO and Switzerland will do everything to make this a, a success and also making a success story uh, be coming out of uh, Geneva for the UN system and to show how multilateralism is really working for the good of the people. Then the, the second example I wanted to mention is where we can really prove that it is also not only a human-centered, but it's also a human rights-centered approach. 
Um, where I would like to mention the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative by OCHA and the ICRC. I think it's so important that we can make sure that data, you know, the, the, which is sort of the future infrastructure and the future capital and the, the future oil of all, all uh, uh, activities, that we can make sure that humanitarian actors can use this data in a safe, responsible way. Um, and I think that also is something where Geneva has a vocation and the European Union to, to make sure that we can um, uh, uh, make that also a success. Then thirdly, for me also human-centered, you know, it's no sense uh, if we want to push the world into a digital world if we ruin our planet. And I think we have to make sure that everything what we do in the digital world also it supports in one way or another a sustainable future of the planet. We have to make sure that it helps uh, the environment in, 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 instead of uh, um, uh, make the situation worse. And I think there uh, also we have to uh, talk about questions like e-waste, you know, what is the, um, the ecolo ecological footprints of, uh, of data centers or mining activities around the world? This has to be also uh, uh, mentioned. And I also would like to uh, commend the efforts of the Internet Governance Forum on uh, setting up the policy network on environment. I think that is also something where Geneva has a vocation with uh, the great actors, which are very often not, not known, but I think there we can really make a difference. And lastly, again, the, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach, I think that is also, uh, when we look at the myriad uh, of actors in Geneva, I think if we can show that multi-stakeholder uh, approach works, we can show it in, in Geneva. Um, and I think we, we, we are already on a, on, on a very good basis, but uh, also there, I think we can improve day by day uh, to make sure that this is really the model of the future um, and that we have to cherish multi-stakeholder more, more in the future. So with these four examples, I mean, these are just four examples, and I think probably we could make a list of hundreds of examples uh, where we can work in the future. I think every country, every organization has its specific um, strategic competences, networks, and expertises. And if we bring that all together in a, in, in a big uh, sort of crowd intelligence, and not only intelligence, but then also roll out the activities, I think we're we're really starting for a, a, a great process and I'm looking forward also to do that uh, together with our European partners, the European Union and future presidencies. So Lotte, thank you so much for moderating and giving us this, uh, this uh, occasion and I hope to see you soon in person in Geneva or somewhere else. Thank you very much Ambassador Vexler and also Thank you for bringing some practical examples uh, to, the, to the table. There are actually a great many of those around uh, in Geneva from ITU to other organizations. And it's important to demonstrate, I think, the practical benefits uh, across the world of closer cooperation on, on uh, digital and digital uh, partnerships. Um, but also, I think that uh, our four eminent speakers have as amply uh, demonstrated how the multilateral uh, level and, and the UN processes complement what's going on uh, at the EU, be it in terms of legislation or soft law, and tallies with what's going on at national level and what we see happening here on Geneva. So I think this is part, together with all the, 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 the colleagues who have, who have joined this whole um, uh, series of debates, the multi-stakeholder society, which in its variedness, which in its riches, uh, is absolutely the only way we can envisage the future. Uh, and what I hear coming through from all speakers is, of course, the multi-stakeholder approach. It's the open, secure uh, internet. It's open access to internet, and it's the human-centric approach. So I think, in uh, based on this sort of bottom-up multi-stakeholder approach. There is a whole set of soft rules that are gradually emerging, hopefully as a more global guidance to how we use the internet. And that's where we rely on the UN and the work uh, done in, um, in, in, in New York uh, by uh, Francesca, coupled with all the many efforts taking place here in Geneva. 
so with that, it just remains me to thank the co-organizers, uh, which is indeed the permanent missions of Slovenia and Switzerland, as well as the Geneva internet platform. I think we have established such a solid partnership by now that there's plenty of potential for coming up with new initiatives. Because while we have called this series of talks, reflections on digital future, uh, it is indeed the beginning of a uh, very long um, series of, of, of thoughts and reflections about how we wish uh, internet and digital to govern the world. So thank you very much, particularly to Jovan and Teresa for having sort of animated this series as well. But thanks for the good partnership and the basis it has provided also for taking uh, forward the profile of Geneva uh, in, in this area. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all the participants uh, for, 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 for loyally uh, staying and contributing to this debate. And I'm glad to see there are so many uh, young people because that's exactly what it is about as well. Be in there, get in there from the very beginning and help uh, shape our future digital world. And, and just to round off on the EU side, where we are indeed going through some quite interesting uh, times. Uh, with everything from the digital decade and its digital partnerships, which we will be rolling out uh, across the world. Uh, there's the Global Gateway that just came out recently and why it is, of course, a broader initiative uh, on infrastructure, mobilizing a lot of funding. Uh, it also has a strong digital component. And right now there's a lot of movement, uh, very timely, on the questions of the Digital Single Act and the Digital Market Act. Uh, in, in terms of the transition between uh, presidencies. But thanks to everybody for this inspiring series uh, and debate dialogue, which I hope we'll be able to uh, continue. So thanks a lot for joining. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, Teresa. <laughs>